In talking to my friends who are scientists, I think we all sort of feel that sense of wonder, that sense of discovery, you know, this feeling that even the, even the most trivial thing that I'm doing in the lab, I might be the first person ever to know this little piece of information, and it feels really interesting. It feels really fun. It's like I'm, you know, I'm peeling the onion. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm peeling back the a little bit more of the truth. I'm trying to learn about, you know, how 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 is our world working? I have a lot of ideas of different endeavors I want to pursue. I think it's my personality a little bit, always need to be on the move. I think as a scientist, it's good to not always be in a comfort zone. As the first time I heard about uh, CRISPR was around 2006, when I read some articles explaining that uh, CRISPR could be used as a way to classify in a more uh, let's say, a fancy manner, different strains of bacteria. So this was the first encountering with, with the CRISPR systems. Then I read about it and that was it for me. I think I first heard about it from Jill Banfield, my colleague here at Berkeley, sometime around 2006. And she was working on bacterial genomes and you know, sequencing bacterial DNA, finding lots of examples of these repetitive sequences called CRISPRs. And hadn't probably paid a lot of attention to them until some research that was published that showed that those sequences included little snippets of viral DNA. And this, you know, was very intriguing because it suggested that bacteria were, you know, keeping these little copies of a viral sequence is around for a purpose. Some research suggested that CRISPRs were using these little RNA copies of DNA sequences to detect and destroy viruses. I was at the time a postdoctoral fellow in the lab of Jennifer Doudna, kind of fresh off the boat. This was at the time when Rodolphe Barangu's science paper came out, establishing the CRISPR system as a, a kind of a primitive bacterial prokaryotic immune system. So my first exposure to this was, uh, was at a journal club that uh, we used to have in, in, in the Downer Group. I remember at the time we were you know, speculating how could this possibly work. The knowledge was really limited to at the time what was hypothesized is that CRISPR was a mechanism that would allow to recognize an infection with a virus and ultimately kill uh, the viruses by targeting the genome of the viruses using protein and RNA components. So this was uh, the hypothesis in 2006. In Puerto Rico in the spring of 2011, I met Emmanuel. We were uh, giving uh, talks at the same session, the same CRISPR session. She said, you know, I've been wanting to, to talk to you. Uh, I'm glad to meet you in person because I've been thinking that you might like to collaborate with my lab on a, on a project. We were talking about a protein that at the time was known as CSN1 and now is known as Cas9. This mysterious CSN1 protein, surely we were predicting the function, but no one could show up to now how it was really working. We had this idea that, okay, the Cas9 protein was somehow going to be cutting DNA, but how exactly it was going to do it, we didn't know at the time. And for Jennifer Downer was uh, extreme, uh, let's say, curiosity on, on really uh, the details of how those proteins work. At the end of the conversation, she said to me, I think it's going to be really fun to work with your lab on this mysterious uh, CSN1. And I, just when she said that, this mysterious CSN1, yeah, I just felt this little chill, you know, going down my back, thinking, you know, this, this, this really is going to be a very interesting uh, protein to study. The collaboration ultimately went very, very fast. It involved a PhD student from my lab, Christoph Szyminski, and a postdoc from our lab, Martin Yinek. Our goal was to really find out what the biochemical function or the mechanism of this 
Cas9 protein uh, essentially was. Right, somehow RNAs seem to be cutting. What we do as biochemists is we set up systems in the laboratory and ask, you know, in isolation, what does this particular molecule do? What is its function? If you do the experiments with the components purified, you bring them together in a test tube and you show that it's working, then you know that you don't need anything more. It's self-sufficient. It's working like this. You don't need anything else from the cell. We said, well, let's see if we can take that strategy using purified Cas9 protein, and we also made purified CRISPR RNA molecules. These little RNA copies of DNA sequences, and then combined them together, and then started testing to see can it use the letters in the RNA of that CRISPR molecule to find a unique DNA sequence and cut it? And initially, the answer was no. No dice. Nothing working. Um, you know, this is a process of trial and error. You know, there could be some silly technical thing going on, like, you know, our protein purification isn't any good, or somehow our, you know, our sample that we're testing is just, you know, has been uh, destroyed in some way. Or maybe there's something missing from the reaction. There was a second type of RNA that Emmanuel's lab had been studying as part of this CRISPR system called tracer. Tracer RNA. It was an RNA molecule which we realized was very abundant in the bacteria. Most likely there was an interesting function. And we realized ultimately that this RNA was encoded by a, a piece of DNA that was in the vicinity of the DNA coding for the CRISPR system. Maybe this tracer RNA molecule has something to see with CRISPR. Maybe CRISPR needs other components. So um, I remember that the students of my lab were telling me, no, 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 this is not the dogma. CRISPR needs the CRISPR proteins and the CRISPR RNAs. You don't need anything else. But we started thinking about it and wondering, you know, maybe it would be important to include the tracer RNA. And this was actually an experiment that was first done by Krzysztof Chylinski, the student in Emmanuel's lab, who was our collaborator on the other side of the, the big pond. And uh, he did that experiment and, and got a beautiful answer, which was that, yes, when you include the tracer RNA, the CRISPR RNA, and Cas9 together in this reconstituted, purified system, now that Cas9 protein could find a unique DNA sequence and cut it. This was one of the milestones in that project, realizing that this tracer RNA was in fact also required for the process of cutting the DNA. Once we knew that, uh, then of course we wanted to see what parts of the tracer RNA are needed for the process. I did a set of experiments that suggested that certain parts of the two RNA molecules were essentially dispensable, but they were dispensable in a way that would allow us to fuse the two RNAs together and in doing so reduce the complexity of the system. Just go directly to DNA cutting without having to put these two RNAs together first somehow. This then led to these experiments with these, these single RNA guide fusions. Martin had made several versions that differed just in the letters of the sequence that would allow Cas9 to find a different piece of DNA. By basically designing the sequence of the guide RNA, you could redirect it to essentially any sequence in, in double-stranded DNA. So we had this thing programmed with five different RNAs, you know, separate samples that would find, in principle, five different places in the DNA and lead to a cut. And you know, he, we were you know, in the lab looking at the result of this experiment. We're leaning over the light box, and we could see that each piece of DNA was a different size corresponding to the length predicted based on the ability of these single guide RNAs to direct Cas9 to cut the DNA at a particular place. We had been able to engineer this thing to be different from how it is in nature and much simpler in a sense. It was a, it was a great moment. This was going to be a programmable system that you could repurpose for other things, including genome editing. Here was something that was truly you know, fascinating. First of all, just fundamentally about nature, and then thinking about how you might be able to use that in other settings and other kinds of cells was, was also incredibly fun, because, you know, the more you thought about it, the more ideas would come, because it was just so, you're clearly going to be so useful for a lot of things.
So there was a very intense few weeks finishing up the last few experiments and writing up a manuscript. And when we were writing the paper, actually, uh, the bright days were coming in uh, Sweden. It, it's very disturbing, physiologically speaking, because you never see darkness, you just see like um, a gray sky. I would work, uh, <laughs> I would have a tendency to work a little bit around the clock and to not sleep a lot. The, the excitement was building up. So the final weeks in this process, there was this, you know, playing ping pong basically with the manuscript. I would realize it's 3 a.m. in the morning because I was uh, corresponding with California and realizing that, uh, that, no, it was really time maybe to get some hours of sleep. And ultimately, the paper that was published in 2012 in, in Science, uh, showing the biologists how they could harness the system, so providing them the guidelines, uh, the recipes to, to use the system for their own purposes, which they did successfully because six months after the publication of uh, our paper in Science, uh, very fast we saw publications showing that the technology uh, was working for genome editing and even engineering in, in plant cells, in human cells, in mice, in different model organisms which biologists uh, use. So this, this was very, very fast actually. It was clearly going to be a race because it, if it worked it was going to be so exciting. I wasn't thinking about, oh my gosh, I mean this is a tool that you know, it fundamentally allows us to change our relationship with nature. It actually allows us to change human evolution if we want to, right? It's that, it's that profound. And it puts into all of our hands as, as, as human beings a tool that, you know, we've never had in the past the ability to change the fundamental chemical nature of who we are in this way. Right? And now we do. And what do we do with that?